thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here this morning, the opportunity to just come before you and Father, just to honor, love, and adore you through our songs of praise, our worship of you, and Father, through uh, communing with you this morning, the things we look forward to doing with you. Father, we just pray that you will inhabit the service with us, that you'll be here with us as we, uh, as we honor you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
had gotten a book from Dawn about Bible verses, and they're very short, and I felt like it was too short, so I wanted to read within the context that surrounded it. So I'm re reading Philippians 1 through 11. So if anybody wants to join, that's fine. Uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at the little time, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon all my remembrance of you, always in every supplication of mine on behalf of you all making my supplication with joy, for your fellowship and furtherance of the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is right for me to be thus minded on behalf of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how long after you all the tender mercies of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more knowledgeable in his discernment, so that ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and avoid all and void of offense unto the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are through Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God.
just a little bit ago from Sharif. The passage in Philippians, it says, And from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He who began a good work in you, and, and Christ has began that work in us. And part of that work is us knowing him and us remembering him. And this is the part of service where we, we turn everything and focus on him. I mean, he gave his all for us. When's the last time you gave your all for him? And so that's that's our goal. He, he's he's going to complete that work in us. He's going to get us to that point that we are his completely. How many of you have reached that point? And so we come to remember him, to remember what he died for. He died because we are sinners. And without his death, without the shedding of his blood, we cannot inherit heaven. He defeated death for us. And so today we're going to remember that that's why we're here. Because of him. The songs we've sang are because of him. Because God loved us enough to send his son that his son could die in our place for sin. And now today we're made righteous through him. Now he's completing that work and part of that work is us worshiping him. Us remembering him. And so this morning as we come to the table, as we remember the sacrifice he made for us, not something we take lightly. I mean, it means eternity for us. And so prepare your hearts and prepare your minds to think just on him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you at this time for your son. We thank you for your love for us that sent him. We thank you for his love for us that he completed the task that you sent him to do. And Father, that today we come to your table in remembrance of him. That we come to celebrate him. That we come to thank him for that sacrifice. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll be with each one that is here, Father, as they prepare their hearts and minds to meet you at your table, to once again celebrate your son. Father, bless, you, bless the cup and the loaf, bless those who partake. We pray this in your son's name.
understand that? You see, when, when we stand up here and we talk, sometimes we're not amplified. And we need what's amplified. We need to do what's there. If I don't put in to the mic, it doesn't come out the speakers. And at offering time, it's, it's that time that we give. And, and if we don't put in, God can't magnify and make it come out better. You know? Now, I understand that God <coughs> owns the cattle on the 10,000 hills. But not just that, he, he owns the hills. And I know that everything that we have, reality, is his. You know, you always hear it say, you, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. We're not taking it with us. But God has blessed us to bless others and to give. It. And this morning we're able to bless by giving and putting in to him that he can then use to put out into others. And whether it's through local programs that we do here, whether it's through missions, whether it's through, I mean, he will magnify or amplify what we give to be so much more than we can imagine. So much more. Um, a minister friend of mine is in Nepal, and he was hiking the, whatever it is that they hike there. And at the end of it, he got to the village he wanted to get to, and he held a meeting for all the area ministers and got to teach and do different things like that. And he did that through missions, through money given to churches like ours that supported him to go and do and teach. Now, I don't know how many of you want to go hike the mountains in Nepal to get to a little village to teach the people about Christ. But you did that through the giving, through the magnification, through the amplification of your giving by God to do those things. And so um, we never know where our gift will end up or how God will use it. We just trust him to take it and use it, right? And so we give. And so this morning, prepare your hearts to give to him that which he could use in his kingdom. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that you give each of us to give back to you a portion of that which you have blessed us with. And Father, we know that uh, we are richly blessed. We have been taken care of by you. And Father, we now give that portion back to you that you can now use to take care of others, to teach others of you, to, to bring more believers to your kingdom. And Father, we pray that you will just bless the gift, bless the givers. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
I like the way Paul always starts off his his discourses or sermons or his writings, and, and he when he says things like, "I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel." He always prays with joy or with love or with satisfaction, knowing that you are there. Now he says he prays with joy because of your partnership. How many of you know what a partnership is? You do? I love it. You're with him, you're a partner. Yes. Yeah. 37 years, yes. How many? 37. Okay. You got a few more to go to catch 41. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Trophy for Cindy. But, but, it, but it's. A partnership. What makes you two a partnership? Yes. What's it? Commitment. Commitment. Do you love them? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll go to a young couple. Do you, do you love them? Yes, you love them. Do you love them? Yeah, yeah. There's love. I mean, when, when Paul's talking, he's saying he's saying that thing, the partnership, the commitment, the, the love, the, the things that you share is what brings us together. The things we share with Paul puts us in partnership with him. What, what is this partnership about? Throughout, throughout Philippians, you're going to read this. The partnership is about Christ and him. It's about what? Partnering with God. Partnering with God. How do we partner with God? Man, that's, that's a big task, isn't it? I mean, you read the Bible? Read the Bible? Do you understand it? Not all the time. So, some things are like, eh. And I said, an artist this morning, I said, read your Bible, and if you have any questions, ask. That's the only way to learn what it's about, is, is ask the questions and see. Well, in this... Paul is writing and he's saying, okay, I want you to be partners with God. Just as I am a partner with God. And, and he talks in, in chapter 1, verse 15, he talks about, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambitions, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does that matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true motives, Christ is being preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Because it doesn't matter what, what motivates you to, to tell about Christ, it doesn't matter what, you, just tell about Christ. Share Him with those around you. You know, bring them so they can become partners with us in the gospel with God and Christ. And so he's talking about this now. Paul's in chains doing these things and, and doing it throughout this writing. He says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now, I don't know how he continues to rejoice when he's in a damp, dark dungeon. Maybe chained to a wall or something. But Paul just keeps this going. Because he knows that he's there, and he tells you earlier he's there because of what? Christ. Go where Christ takes you. Be content where you are. Oh, that's hard sometimes, isn't it? How many of you here have never wanted more? We want more, don't we? God has blessed us, and here we are, but we want more. We want more. I mean, what do we do? What do we do with the more? I'll tell you what I do with the more. Um, waste it. Uh, spend it on things that we didn't really need, but now we got them. I mean, I literally have rooms at the house full of stuff. I can't tell you what's there. I mean, we used to live where, where John Eckler lives in town, and, and we moved out here to Lee Tana. And when we moved to Lee, Lee Tana, we put everything in the garage. 
And then from there, we started setting up the house and doing everything like that. When we got done setting up the house, there were about 20 or 25 boxes in the garage. But we got the house set up, or so we left the boxes. When we moved from that house seven years later, those boxes were still in the garage. What do you do with those boxes? How many of you move them? Take them with you. How many of you? How many of you put them in storage? How many of you? How many of you? Here's what I did. I took 25 boxes and set them at the curb. And this big truck came by and they threw them all in and he drove off. That was a long time ago and still today I get my wife saying, what was in those boxes? <laughs> She's a French. <laughs> I don't know what was in the boxes, but I know this. For seven years we lived there and the house was set up and we didn't need it. Now, that time has passed, time has gone on, and, and I'll just bet, if we ever move from where we're at, it'll be a hundred boxes. We're going to go into rooms and say, oh gosh, I, I forgot we had this. Well, we, we did forget we had it because now we got two more in the kitchen. <laughs> you know? How many, how many air fryers do we really need? But we forget that, oh, we set it here, so let's, and different things, it's just, it's just, God has blessed us beyond, I'm trying to tell you, beyond. And so, as I join with him, I've got to try my best to bless others. Um, no, I'm not going to bless you with an air fryer, okay? But I will bless you with what he has really given me, and that's his word. And his ability to partner with him and an ability for us to be his and to be doing the things that God would have us to do. Now, he says some key things in, in Philippians. Um, uh, verse 27 of chapter 1. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What manner is that? Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And uh, when you become a Christian, they say that your, your goal is to become like Christ. Okay, so, um, like how many years you've been a Christian, you think? Guess to me. Just guess. Sixty. Sixty, but been living it for two. No, I'm just joking. Just joking. Um, sixty years. So in sixty years, from the first day till now, have you matured? Have you matured? Have you become? Yes. Yes. Very much. So. Very much. Look at him. Gray hair. A little bit wrinkles, uh, <coughs> mature. But what I'm asking is, did you mature in Christ? Very much. You know, the first day that we accept Him, how are we? Yeah. I was an idiot. I'll just tell you, I was an idiot. You know, you all know that. Oh, come on, bring it, Satan. Oh, don't ever ask Satan to bring it, because he did. The very next day. I tell you about it. How did I do? You all know this. How did I do? Fail. Fail. Now today I'm not dumb enough to say, "Come on, say, bring it." But come on, say, bring it. Because of my maturity, because of what I've learned, because of what I know, because of the things that I do, I can stand up against that. Um, pressure or or sin a whole lot better today than I could then.
because of the maturity in it. And when he says, live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, he's saying, live the gospel. What's the gospel? Love, commitment, sharing. I mean, all the different things. It's, it's the fruits of the Spirit. It, it's, the, it, it's the things that we look at and say, okay, this is, this is Christ. It, it's asking the question, okay, if I'm going to live worthy to, to the gospel of Christ, if I'm in this situation, what would Jesus do? What would his reaction to this situation that I got me into be to get out? Now, a lot of times we think that I got me here, I'll get me out. How does that work for you, Becky? I'm usually in. Usually in. Tough to get out because you put yourself in. And we got to get someone else, rely on something else to get us out of Live the gospel of Christ. Jesus, when he was tempted, did what? Quoted scriptures. When he quoted scriptures, he used the gospel itself to get himself covered and, and through. I mean, we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to be his and use him to get us through this life that he did perfectly that we can't do. We're only made righteous through Him. We're only made perfect through Him. It says here, be a good citizen of Christ. How do you become a good citizen of Christ? What does it mean to be a citizen? You all are a citizen of the United States of America. There are certain rights and privileges that come with that citizenship. That people who don't have that citizenship don't have the rights and an ability to unless we give it to them. So what do you get when you're a citizen in Christ?
took care of everything you need to take care of today. Don't you sleep good? Do any of you ever go to bed fretting and fuming and wondering, and, oh, gosh, or... How do you get to sleep? It's not by counting sheep. It's about going to the shepherd. And you might have to confess something to him. You might have to uh, apologize to him. You might have to uh, ask for forgiveness. You might, you might, gosh, you might have to get out of bed and get on your knees, depending on what you did. To get rid of whatever it was so that you can have that restful night's sleep. I mean, I, I've had a couple of nights recently where, and I toss and turn and toss and turn, and I wake up in the morning to make sure my pillows are still there. Because in my thoughts and dreams, I mean, I'm fighting whatever I'm fighting. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So, so I had to go to God and say, okay, I don't know what it is, I don't know what turmoil or what. Take it. Help out. And when I got to bed Friday night, I slept like a baby. Not a true baby. I slept all the way through the night. A true baby sleeps a couple hours, gets up, cries, pees, and drinks some milk, and goes back to sleep. <clears throat> but I mean, I slept like a baby through the night. And last night, I slept like a baby through the night. Because I knew this. If I ask God for it, is he not faithful to take it? And I turned it over. I said, I don't know what it is that I'm fussing with. I don't know what it was, but I know this. It's, it's not there. And that restful sleep has come back to be restful sleep. And he goes through, Paul continues through, and he talks about Timothy, and he talks about Epaphroditus and, and different things. He talks about in chapter 2, imitating Christ's Humility. That's the title my Bible gives it. Imitating Christ's humility. If any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being of the same Spirit and purpose. Help me, Lord, to have the same love that you have. Well, what love does he have? Absolute complete love. For what? For all of us. Let me answer this question. Who's unsavable? I mean, if he can save me, he can save you. If he can save me and you, who else is there that he can't save? Nobody. Even when we think how evil people can be, even when we think how bad people can be, even, even when we, we think it's not going to happen. Um, Dale is a man that I baptized up in Punta Gorda, and uh, Dale has this real heart for um, sex slaves and abused children. And when I asked that question up there, I said, I said, who can't be saved? And he says, the sex lifers. Those who put them in the Man, you don't understand this. God will forgive them if they ask. Those who abuse small children, God will forgive them if they ask. Those who don't obey mom and dad, God will forgive them if they ask. Us who sin, even though we've claimed him, God will forgive us if we ask. If we're repentant of it, if we're sincere in our everything, he'll do that. He'll, and he'll give us that same love that he has for us. And it says here, not only just the love, but the, the tenderness and the spirit and the compassion and the joy. If we but have the same love, being of the same mind, and of the same spirit. That's being able to say in your life, 
not my will, but yours be done. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys get this when I say it over and over. This is not about us. It's about Him. We came this morning to worship Him. To be the servants to Him. To praise, honor, and adore Him. To come to His throne and, and meet with Him with, with this meal to remember His Son. It, it's everything that we do this morning is about Him. And if you came here this morning for you, you lose. I am working out my salvation with God. I am working on my walk with Him, and I need this to help me get through it. You see, when, when I come to church, and, and, and or if I happen to miss, last week I wasn't here, and it was important that we got to church somewhere, you know, so that if nothing else, I could commune with God. That I can remember his son, and I can remember that this is the reason I live. Because a price was paid for me to live that life. And I think some of you are like minded with me in it because you're here today instead of being somewhere else. You're here saying, okay, I'm here. God, what do you have for me? God, while I'm here, strengthen me and lift me up and get me ready to go back out those doors and fight the battles you placed before me this week. And the battles may not seem like battles. It may be just talking to someone about Christ. Give me the strength to talk to them, to say the words, to invite, to, to do whatever. Um, Kelly was saying in Sunday school, she has a girl that at work, she worked with, and she asked this. Pray that I get the right words and I lead her right. That's why we're here today. Put more of him in and get more of us out. So that when we meet people like that, it's him speaking through us and not us. So today, as we go through Philippians, I mean, I mean, I'm just highlighting things. It says, learn to be a partner. He's going to say this in here. Um, or I didn't write down the verse. That's a bad one. I'm glad we rejoice with you. You learn to rejoice with me. Work out your... And continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for God. It is God who works in you to will and to do what pleases Him. That's what I was just talking about. It's about Him for His will and, and what His pleasure is for us. How many of you have ever used a tool? What does that tool do? If I take a pair of pliers, what does that what does that tool do? Does it direct me to where I need to be and, and do this? What does that tool do? Whatever I, the master of the tool, tell it to do. And that's what they're saying here. We're a tool in God's hand. To be used by him as he pleases and he wills. Just go with it. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever taken a wrench and it fought you. Anybody take a wrench and it fought you? You might have fought so in a tight spot under the sink or something, but it wasn't the wrench's fault. Yeah. He's probably using a right-handed wrench with his left hand. Who knows? But, but, it's about, it's about him and doing his work, his will, his way, as he guides, leads, and shows us. As he guides and shows us. Then it says this. Um, oops, lost. Learn to be partners, and Paul says this, in suffering with Christ. Now, if I, had I known the day that I walked the aisle that I would have to suffer just like he suffered, let me think twice. Do you know how he suffered? I mean, he lived a life that, um, 
I'm sure his uh, brother and sisters ridiculed him. Oh yeah, Mr. Perfect. Anybody have brothers and sisters that treat you like that? You know what I'm saying? He suffered that. At age 12, how many of you told your mom and dad, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? I think my dad probably would have smacked me through to tomorrow. You know? But knowing Mary and Joseph, knowing who Christ was, knowing the gift that he was to them, knowing where he came from, it was just a very stark reminder. I mean, we could probably say those words at some point to our family. Who wants us to go do this or do that or do this or do that? And you say, hey, don't you know I need to be about what God would have me to do? Sometimes they'll try and pull you in this direction, that direction, or whatever, but man, at some point, we've got to realize that I'm Christ, and it's not me and not my will, it's what He wants. Not what the world wants from me, not the family, but what He wants. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I'd rather be at the family dinner than at someone's bedside or or going to meet someone to talk to them about a problem they have or something like that. But it's not what I want, it's what God wants. And sometimes we sacrifice what we want so that He can shine through us. We're going to partner with Him in His agony. And if you think that life is tough for you right now, I don't know if you can see this, but on the horizon, it's going to get tougher. It, it's going to get worse. Even Scripture tells us that, that, that these things have to happen so that the Son of Man can return. These things, what are these things? Man turning against God. Man rebelling. Man thinking he's it. And we see it throughout history every time something like that rises up. I mean... How many times in the Old Testament did God have to hold people down when they got to thinking? I mean, Tower of Babel comes to mind, doesn't it? What does build a tower up to be like God? I mean, we as man just think that we're sometimes it. We're not it. We're a flea on a dog. We can be plucked off and got rid of just in a heartbeat. The God who created me can take me out. I understand that. My goal is this, through, through Philippians, what he's trying to teach people is this, to be partners with Christ, even in his suffering, be partners with Christ, even in the good works, be partners with Christ in his love, spirit, and soul, be partners with Christ in all things. So that when it's done, when it's over, we get the reward. What's the reward? Heaven. To me, to me, the reward is, is a phrase that says, enter in the good and faithful servant. That's the only thing I'm looking for. Don't get me wrong, I live in this life and there's things that end me a lot. I love the fact that my son got married and we have a grandkid. I'm waiting for the day that my daughter gets married and waiting for the day that Jesse just gets out of my house. <laughs> you know, those things, it's just, there's things I look forward to, but nothing compares to what I look forward to in heaven. Nothing compares to those words being said to me as, as I stand at the gate to enter in. I think I've done what I can do to make sure that my sons and daughters will follow me. That they'll come through that gate too. I'm not done. We're still teaching, training, showing, doing stuff. But, but I think that, that they've got it. They're, they're more than just good people. They have a relationship with Christ. 
they know who he is, what he is, and what he desires for them. What Paul is building up to in the book of Philippians is this word, commissioned. He's going to get to it, commissioned. Do you know what it means to be commissioned? Um, I commissioned a drawing to be done by an artist about, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago. There's an artist who does, who does pencil point pictures. And if you've never seen one, I mean, I've got to go to the house, I'll bring it. But he takes a, this pencil and he just does point, 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 point. And as he does that, he creates this 3D, just awesome looking. He does any kind of airplane you can think of. This is real forte. He's done lighthouses and other things. But, but um, Tom and Liz were here, and uh, Tom used to work on a certain aircraft. And he said, you know, I was going around doing this and doing this. So I, I called this guy, and I said, okay, I, I've got a couple of your pictures, but do you have, and I forget what plane it was, I would say a B-10 bomber or something. It wasn't, but it was some fighter aircraft. But he said, I never have done that. Okay, so what will it take to do that? He said, well, you have to commission a picture to be done. What does that mean? It means you get the number one original. I get the rights to copy them all for others. Okay, I get the number one original. Well, his pictures, he sold them for $35 to $40 each. You know, this one cost me $250 up front just to have him draw it. And then he sold me the picture. And I got the number one. It, it's a pencil art. It, it, it's a great picture. But I, I had him commissioned to do that so that I could give that as a gift to Tom and Liz one year Christmas. And, uh, you know, just the look on his face was worth it. And I'm telling you a story because I want you to understand this. Throughout Philippians, he's, he's building this up to this point. He's going to say, be commissioned. How many of you have been commissioned? How many of you have been commissioned? You, do you know what your commission is? Go ye therefore in all the world, teaching, preaching, and baptizing. It's pretty important. Matthew wrote about it. Luke wrote about it. Mark wrote about it. John wrote about it. In Acts, they wrote about it. Go ye therefore in all the world, teaching, preaching, and baptizing. What does that mean? You have a job. just a pilot to go and seek and save the lost. Not just a student, but to seek and save the lost. And wherever you are, wherever God plants you, seek and save the lost. You're commissioned to do so. If you're his. If you're in the same spirit as Jesus, same love of Jesus, same hope, then you're commissioned. And I wanted to tell you that today because a whole lot of you sometimes don't think that you are, but man, you've got a job. Paul's telling them here. Some people preach out of uh, envy. Some, some out of. He says, "I don't care why you preach. I don't care why you teach people. I don't care why you tell them about Christ. Just tell them about Christ." You know, you, you might tell uh, some of you ladies might tell a guy about Christ because you think he's cute. That's okay. Just tell him about Christ. You can think he's cute. The whole deal is, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever God has placed you, you are commissioned to do His work. And if I want to, if I want to hear the words, well done, a good and faithful servant, then in my relationship with Him, I've got to be His servant, doing His work in His way. And He commissioned me to tell others about Christ. I got it easy. I'm going to tell you, I got it easy. Because you come to me and I get to tell you. I still go outside these doors and tell others. 
I still go and tell others because that's what I'm commissioned to do. To go therefore into all the world. And maybe it's my neighbors. Maybe it's my family. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. Maybe it's... We, we had a great message sent to us this week. Deb Spore, who talks about her husband Rick, and Rick came and visited with us and has done some things with us and, and things going on and on and on. And Deb Spore has prayed for years. She felt commissioned to save her husband Rick, to show him Christ. And this week she sends me this, this text and it says, I just got to share this with you. I'm, I'm ecstatic. And Rick lives here. She's up there trying to help take care of family. And she comes out and sees him. And he goes up there. He went up there to see her and went to church with her and did stuff. And that minister did what I couldn't do. Reached him. We planted seeds and they were watered by others. We, we know that. But while Rick was there, Rick gave his life to Christ and was baptized. Years and years and years and years of prayers by his wife and by others, by us who knew about it, uh, comes to fruition. Because someone else also was commissioned. We told them, some of you told them, some of you had meals with them and shared with them, some of you... And it, and it just built up, built up, built up until this other one that's commissioned in New York says, hey, you know, king, and the light bulb went off. And I'm going to tell you this. It's because of you, your partnership with Christ, your love and spirit and with him that got Rick that point. If it was just going to New York meeting this guy, it might not have happened. But we planted seeds, we watered those seeds, we weeded around those seeds, but we took care of that plant until the day was right. God's timing is always perfect, right? Then he got it. And we can rejoice today in the fact that he got it. And that we were a part, a vital part of him getting it. They're going to be back in June. They'll be back in church with us uh, in June. And, you know, don't forget, he made a decision. Don't forget to congratulate. Don't forget to uh, welcome him into the family, to the like believers. Those things. But Philippians teaches us a lot. A lot. It, it teaches us that God is looking for us. It said here that towards the end, and, and so the people waited for the call and the charge to go forth so that they could partner with God. Man, you're going to hate that you were here today <clears throat> because now you know you've been commissioned. You've been given the charge. You know that God is now calling for you to go. Or maybe you love that you were here today so that you know that, so that you're, you're locked in. Okay, now I'm fully sure that he said it, so okay, we're going to go. <coughs> maybe those who aren't here missed it. Maybe they'll miss the fact that they've been commissioned to go. If you're here this morning, you're commissioned. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've been baptized into him, you're commissioned. You have a job. You're sitting here this morning and you haven't accepted the Lord and Savior. I mean, now you know what He wants. He wants you. He wants to be able to commission you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to live with you. He wants to give to you that which He has. His love. His spirit. His purpose. Look at yourselves this morning. Are you his. Not do you know him, not do you, are you his? Do you feel like you've been commissioned to go and do for him 
because of him. Wherever you are, wherever he has you planted, with whoever's around you. You see, you are. You're commissioned. And you're not just commissioned. He needs you. Look at the state of the world today. Look at the state of America. I mean, God needs his people to stand up, stand firm. He needs us to be his hands and feet and start <coughs> shouting it from the mountaintops. Because if we don't, we'll cease to exist. Now, when I was in college, they said that the Christian church wouldn't, the churches in America, the religious people, won't exist in the next 20 years. Well, we beat that. It's been more than 20 years. But they reiterated it in some of their findings in a Barna Institute survey saying if, if the churches don't change, if they don't start serving him instead of being served by him, we will cease to exist in 20 years. Churches lose. Staggering number. You ready? Churches lose in America about a thousand members a week. What? And there are churches that are growing, so some churches are really declining. You know, what caused it? His people not standing up. His people not feeling commissioned. His people not doing the work that God has sent them out to do. And so, this morning, we're going to have an invitation. It's an invitation for you to look at your own life. No one else but you. Are you his? And do you feel commissioned? If you don't feel commissioned, there's some work, there's some study that needs to be done so that you can find out what God wants you to do. The easy part is this. Will we therefore in all the world teach you, preach you, baptize you? He's already said it. He's already sent us. We just got to get it. We can't be too shy. We can't be too awkward. We can't be too backward. We can't be all these things. We can't be too busy. We can't be... He needs us, and he needs us today to stand for him. So if you have a decision to make for Christ, if you have a choice to make, I mean, as we stand and as we sing, make your choices for him.
rejoice greatly in the Lord that at the last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have now had opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content wherever and whatever my circumstances. I know what, is, what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He says, no matter where you are, no matter what you are, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm too shy. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I, I'm too busy. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We can do it through Him, not through us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for those who are present who, Father, are uh, willing to give of their time for you. And, Father, we just pray that uh, this morning they're, they're willing and able to be commissioned for you, that they'll, Father, work for you throughout their lives to be your servants, your people, doing your work in your way. Father, we thank you for the songs this morning that guided us to your throne. We thank you for us allowing us to come to your throne and, and remember your son. We thank you for the opportunity to give back on a portion of your new and Father, to Read your word and understand that, Father, you, you love us. You want us you want us to be partners with you in all things. Father, help us to be those partners you desire. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.